Well, you know, as good as this ride has been, we might be approaching the end. The Dallas Mavericks fall in Game 3, 109-100 at the AAC, putting them in a 3-0 hole against the Golden State Warriors. And if you look back to my preview, or if you just recall my preview ahead of this series, you know that I did have some concerns about the fuel left in the tank. I said, if there is still adequate fuel to get through this series, then it's very battle-tested and it's clean-burning, was how I used the term. I didn't think the Warriors had really been tested until maybe the attitude and chippiness of that Grizzlies series. But even then, I don't think they were as battle-tested as Dallas. But they are fresh. They are very fresh. And Dallas looks to be on absolute fumes at this point. Whether we're talking about the first, the first half 19-point lead in Game 2 that evaporated and the Warriors take their first lead of the game very into the third quarter and then go on to pull away by like 7 or something in that game. Or whether we're talking about this game where Dallas just never really looked like they were there. The legs looked like they were betraying them. The, the three-point shooting was rough. It kind of rounded back into form a little bit by the end of the half, but the percentages still weren't good. It just looked like a team that didn't have a lot left to fight with, and it felt like Game 2 was really their best shot. They had to have Game 2 because they didn't have the same energy or even really, frankly, desperation levels I think they needed. I think that mental block kind of got in there, and... The, the flaws with this team, the weaknesses, were just exposed and mercilessly targeted throughout this series to the point where uh, Looney, a guy that's a borderline starter, not, not a great player, certainly not you would think better than like, oh, in terms of all-around game like DeAndre Ayton. Uh, you know, you worried about like Rudy Gobert. You worried about Hassan Whiteside. You worried about how those front courts would expose ours And yet Dallas was able to get away with all of that. And suddenly in game two, the ridiculous Golden State comeback comes largely because Kayvon Looney goes for like 21 and 10, just absolutely shredding the Mavericks. 14 of those come in the third quarter, mercilessly targeting Dallas just with easy dump off drive and dump off passes for dunks and layups and just everything he wanted. Rebounding has been a problem in this series too. The front court rebounding Luca's the only rebounder this Dallas team really has. Your high rebound man was Luca with 11. The next closest was, J- was Jalen Brunson with five. Your two guards got your most rebounds. You want to know more about what the front court rebounding situation is in this series? Steph Curry has more than Dwight Powell and Maxi Kleba combined. Steph. Yeah, and I think I had. That actual stat somewhere here. It's pretty bad. (laughs) It is 25 for Steph, 15 through three games for Maxie and Dwight combined. Add in the fact that Maxie has gone ice cold for how hot of shooting he was against Utah. And I think he might have had a good shooting game, like game one or two in Phoenix. The shot has betrayed him again. He's, you know, not giving you anything there. And you're not getting the rebound. Now, he's still defending generally well, although I think Dallas, as they've run out of fuel now, they the popular phrase you keep seeing used is a traffic cone, traffic cone defense, where it's just like the Warriors are just going right around them almost as if they're immobile, stationary. That's basically what's happened here in this series. Dorian Finney-Smith hasn't had a big shooting game since game four, I think, in the Phoenix series. And now you're in a situation where even his defense is betraying him. And I get it, right? Like... You have immense, immense mileage that's been put on Reggie Bullock and Dorian Finney-Smith in this series. Not this series, this playoff run, the last month or so. Playing 40, 45 minutes in some cases. If you look at, I forget who had the stat, but if you look at uh, miles tracked going up and down the court in the playoffs, they're both in the top three in terms of miles tracked. The mileage has been heavy. And you've been asking them, you know, game two, you got... 30 out of, you got like, what was it? 30 out of Jalen, 30 out of Luca, and uh, 21 out of Reggie. That's, that's your series in itself. In and of itself, that is your series. 
I want to double check that because I almost feel like Luca might have had a 40 piece. Yeah, Luca had 42 in that game. Excuse me. He had 42. Reggie had 21. Jalen had 31. You lost that game because your next high score was Doreen with 10. No one else gave you anything in that in that game. Then you come back in this game and you get 40 out of Luca, 20 out of Jalen, 26 out of Dinwiddie. Nothing else out of anyone else. This team just doesn't have the adequate firepower to combat this. And then their weakness in the front court, the fact that they don't have a guy who can actually rebound and that they don't have someone to take at least that burden off of Luca's shoulders is putting everything on them. The, the mileage finally caught up with them. The Warriors never sit still. Steph never sits still. Constantly running up and down. The ball movement is phenomenal. Phoenix is not as diverse in what they do, and that allowed them to back themselves into a couple of rough spots in which Dallas was able to then capitalize. It played into their hands defensively. The Warriors are very much finding and attacking the flaws of Dallas' defense relentlessly, and they're closing out games going at Luka mercilessly. And, you know, Phoenix did that in Game 2, a little bit in Game 1, but especially Game 2. Dallas made an adjustment, and Phoenix couldn't really do it again. The Warriors are not letting that happen. The Warriors have outcoached Dallas. The, the slide and fall apart in Game 2, Kid did not have a great second half, and he was trying to find something. Frank Nilakina, as good as he was closing out that, helping close out that Phoenix series, uh, an X factor that kind of turned the tide there. Dallas just doesn't have that counter punch in this series. Frank has had a rough series. You can't go to Josh Green in big moments like they tried to in Game Two. You just are in a situation where you don't have the firepower needed because Dorian's shot has betrayed him now. Maxi's shot has betrayed him just from fatigue. Uh, you're not getting any rebounding in the front court. You had Game Two. Dallas getting outscored in the paint 62 to 26. Like, you're not going to overcome that. You're just not. You're not going to overcome that. And I know we talked about how in the first round they were able to kind of play this risky game where it's like, hey, if you're shooting 45% or whatever from three, then you can live with that. But they haven't been. They've gotten a ton of three point looks in this series, but the mileage put on them, not just in the playoffs as a whole, but in this series, how they are mercilessly running themselves ragged, trying to catch up and keep up with these guys, has completely shot their legs of any anything they had left. And now you're in a situation where the Warriors are getting everything they want, and Dallas, even if they're big three guys or three guys out of four are stepping up and playing big, they're just not able to keep it in front of them. They don't have the firepower here. And I said last round that Phoenix was a better, deeper team but Dallas outcoached them and outplayed them in the big moments. And I thought Phoenix's hubris and weak mental mentality, mental mentality, that's redundant, uh, played into Dallas's hands. Golden State's not going to do that. They're too good. They're too, they're too battle tested for that. They've been to the mountaintop that Phoenix, for some reason, thought they owned. That's, that's just the long and short of it. They're better coached than Phoenix is. They have better veterans who have been there and know they've seen everything. It's not just like, hey, Dallas just needs to attack Steph Curry more. Do you think Kerr and Golden State and Curry have not seen that forever now? Everything you could possibly throw at them and do, it, do to them to try and slow them down? People don't realize, like, yeah, this wasn't a great Golden State team at times the second half of the season. After the All-Star break, they looked like they were falling apart, but Draymond missed a lot of time this year, and he's been killing Dallas in this series. He is so good at all these little things he does defensively, whether it's bothering shots. I mean, now he's hitting a couple big shots here and there, whether it's a three or getting a, a key block or a rip and a steal. He's having these big moments that just makes him so, so valuable to them. And they didn't have him for a lot of the year. Then Steph, after the All-Star break, missed a lot of time. They didn't care. They're like, you know what? We, can, we know we can go win on the road. We're not going to sweat it if we have to go win a road playoff series. And understandably so. They can say that more than anyone. As much as Phoenix claimed that they fought too hard to get the, um, that they fought too hard to get home court advantage all the way through the playoffs, they're like, oh, it just wore us out. Golden State's like, bro, we don't care. We've been there. We've done that. And they would contend that the 72 win team, or sorry, 73 and 9 team uh, pushed that too much. And that's why they didn't win a title that year, is because they were too obsessed with what wasn't the goal. Maybe that is true, but even still, 
they're not worried about it now. They're healthy, they're dangerous, they're balanced. I still say they're not as good. They're better than the 2015 team that won their first championship. I don't think they're as good as the the two Durant title teams they had. And the only reason they don't beat the Raptors and Kawhi in 2019 is because Durant and Clay are lost for the series, both to major injuries. Clay then gets another injury, misses another full year. It's just like, at full strength, that Warriors team, I think, beats Toronto. Toronto it still would have been a nice series, but Toronto just didn't have the firepower. They they benefited from catching a Warriors team falling apart because they had been to the finals five straight years and their bodies were just beaten to hell. So this is just where it's at. Dallas is in a situation now where they're down three games to none. No team has ever come back to win a series trailing by three. And, you know, or if 3-0, I should really specify. I guess it doesn't matter no matter what. But, uh... It really is a situation where they're just out of gas and they don't have the counter punches. They've looked everywhere they could to try and find some semblance of an answer and they haven't found it. And whether it's been Luca, not uncharacteristically so, not reading what's being thrown at him defensively as well, whether it's been him not understanding how to, to make his adjustments and control the pace of the game and the flow of the game, or whether it's kid. Uh, in that second half or that second game when they blow the 19 point lead, this is uh, from Kirk Henderson on Twitter. He says in that game, the Mavericks called a timeout or did not call a timeout from 221 of the second quarter until 748 of the fourth quarter. That was during the run in which they completely lost their grasp on that game. During that time, they were outscored 49 to 26 221 left in the second to 748 left in the fourth and kid after the game basically said like sometimes you can't just call a timeout sometimes the guys just got to save themselves i i don't know about that man sometimes even if you don't have like an actual strategic counter punch sometimes you kind of just got to give a guy like give them a second to breathe and collect themselves so i don't know about that i think he's been out coached here and that's not to take away from the playoffs run that he's had or how they've adjusted with this team in general, because it has been nothing short of masterful. But this is a series where because you're getting murdered in the paint, because you're getting you're getting out rebounded for the series like 140. It feels like it feels like you're just getting destroyed in this series on the glass. Let me let me take a look at this, actually. So let's look game one. You got out rebounded. 51-35. Game two, you got out-rebounded. 43-30. A little better, a little better. And then game three, you got out-rebounded. Actually, you know what? No, nope, no, nope, never mind. 47-33. <laughs> You're getting out-rebounded, and the difference is, unlike Utah, unlike Phoenix, you're not countering it by shooting 45% or whatever from three as a team. You're just not. And so that's what it is. The calculus that allowed you to get away with it in the first two rounds is suddenly not there because you're shooting 29% from three this game. You're shooting 47% actually to your credit in game two. So it really shows you game two was the punch for Dallas. When that failed to land, that's when you knew it was trouble. And then 23% in game one from three. That's where you knew. Get everything rode on game two. You had to have that. And now the tone and attitude you hear is like, and I'm not trying to disparage any of these guys at all, but now the tone you're hearing is like, look, man, we're here ahead of schedule. Uh, this is a great learning experience. And Luca, you know, reminding guys after the media after this game, like, you know, I'm still learning a lot. I'm 23. Like, I didn't have a great game for the first three quarters. I get that. I understand that. And I'm not trying to rag on Luca. Obviously, he's now in really weird territory where he's had four, four playoff games in his career in which, or no, it's the last four times he has scored 40-plus points in a playoff game, the Mavericks have now lost, going back to Game 7 against the Clippers last year. That's hard to swallow, and that ties the NBA record. Um, I think it's Rick Barry that had that previously in like the 60s or something. That's brutal. That is absolutely brutal, but it's like, well, I mean, what do you do, you know? Brunson has had a very good playoff run. He's had some shaky moments here and there, but he's been as stable as anybody 
on the Mavericks team. Uh, you've had some moments where Dinwiddie has finally shown up, although it's been very inconsistent. You got 21, like I said, in game two out of Reggie Bullock, and yet you could not capitalize and seal the deal on that. So you've got some guys showing up and making some noise here and there, but unless you can find that consistency, you're just not going to be able to counteract what these teams are throwing at them. That's just that's just the truth of it. Uh, let's see here. From Callie Kaplan, here's that full Luca quote. First three quarters, I played very bad. That's on me. I'm still learning. I think after this season is done, wherever or whenever we are, I'm going to look back and learn a lot of things. This is my first conference finals in NBA. I'm 23, man. I'm still learning a lot. That's true. And I think it's... I hope they can avoid the sweep and at least settle for a gentleman's sweep. The problem is... I think they understand now that they're not going to win this series. And I think once you open that door, it's hard not to have it blown open on you. It's like if there's a strong wind pressing at the door, as soon as you willingly turn the handle, that shit's going to fly open. And that's just going to be, that's going to be difficult to contend with. So yeah, it's, it sucks, but this is what, this is what you run into sometimes, you know? They got here earlier than we thought they would. We came into the season saying, just get a playoff series, and we're good. Then where they were end of December to get where they were and where they are now is nothing short of from miraculous, you know? You took down the number one seed, the team that was, for the better part of the year, the best team in the league. You took them down, beat them to a pulp in their own house, and you beat another team that you were also not expected to beat. You can't beat that. And you found something now. You confirm what Jalen is. You found your coach. You think you've got something, at least for the short term, in Dinwiddie. Obviously, you've got him on contract for a little bit, but I don't know how far down the road he plays into your plans. The point is, you've got something here that now you just have to figure out what is that next thing. I don't think it's as simple as saying, hey, we just need a big. Like, if you drop, like, hell, drop Rudy Gobert on this team. Are they better defensively? Yes. Would it help them solve the Warriors riddle? No, I don't think so. I, I think it obviously helps your rebounding, which can play a big part in that. But I think the Warriors, with their their system and their movement and their um, three-point shooting, I think it still keeps you pretty well buried in that hole where you're just going to be hard-pressed to deal with that. Now, to be fair, for the most part, nobody's had an answer for that Warriors riddle in seven years aside from the two when they just had zero health at all but that's just kind of the nature of things man so i don't know how long this goes from here regardless i'm just gonna say man enjoy the ride like i i've said that a time or two just enjoy the ride because we didn't expect to be here this is house money and would we have liked to push to six sure would we have loved to have won the series of course hell yes but at the same time, this team's attitude, resolve, grit, fight, heart, hustle, all that, all those adjectives you could look for, they demonstrated those things. All those things you could look for, they demonstrated. So you're thrilled. You're thrilled. Do you have everything? No. But, and I, and I heard this point made on the ticket earlier this morning, um, Nico Harrison came in and within a couple months of kind of observing in season, the KP situation said, no, this isn't going to work. We're going to move on. And he made a deal that made the team better, made them demonstrably better. This season would not have been possible. This postseason run would not have been possible had you kept KP. It just wouldn't, if no other reason than availability. So now you look at this and you say like, okay, what's, what's left? You know, like what's the next move? Now that they're going to have a little bit of good graces, now that they'll have a little bit more respect, I think they're going to be more aggressive, and I think we might. Maybe I'm selling myself on this, getting my hopes up like I've done so many times in the past, but maybe they're going to actually be aggressive in free agency, and maybe they'll actually have a legitimate shot at landing one or two nice pieces, even if they got to make some maneuvers to open it up. Um, maybe they can make this team better because had this team gone to six or seven against the Warriors, ha had they advanced, they weren't going to change this team too much. 
They might make one piece, make one change that makes a little bit better. But now you're like, okay, we have a good team, but this team will not get over the top. Like you look at the age of some of these guys, Maxi. Uh, how old is Dorian Finney-Smith? I want to say he's like 29. Dorian Finney-Smith. Dorian's age is 29. Yeah. So Dorian's here. You just locked him up. So you got him through age 33. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head how much time Maxi still has, but you're not going to have some of these guys long, long term. And, you know, you want to make the move that makes you best down in the long run. So unless you think you can re, re, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reload. And essentially, we'll go for it all right now, this next year. You're probably going to see some guys that have been here a while getting moved. That's just the nature of things, man. Sometimes you have to be willing to do that. And in past years, the past several years, this team has had zero. This front office, I should say, has had zero willingness to do that. So now we can see. Now we'll see. How aggressive are they going to be? What kind of moves are they going to make? What kind of options are they even going to have available? Is it a, is it a move they make in free agency? Is it a trade they make? Only time will tell. But for now, we still got some basketball left. Enjoy the ride. Be loud. Be, uh, be as rambunctious and everything you can cheering on your team in this next game. Because no matter what, I think it's the last one we're getting at the AAC this year. And this team deserves all of their flowers for this run. But that is my time. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. If you haven't already, leave a like, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.